Piccadilly Circus in the heart of London stands one of Britain's most famous landmarks. You may think that the winged figure up there is Eros, the boy god of romantic or sexual love. But it isn't. It's his much less raunchy brother, Anteros, the god of selfless love. Not a hugely popular quality today, but the Victorians were very keen on it. To them, this was the angel of Christian charity. The statue was built to honour one of the greatest do-gooders of the 19th century, the 7th Earl of Shaftesbury, a man convinced the key to mending broken Britain lay with its youth. Shaftesbury declared, the future hopes of a country must, under God, be laid in the character and condition of its children. And he was to start a revolution that transformed the lives of children and indeed our very idea of childhood. In what was really a very short space of time, children went from being exploited to being idealised. They moved out of the workplace and into the schoolroom. This was the age when, against all precedent, children began to have rights of their own. And none of this would have happened were it not for an extraordinary, energetic, and let's be honest, quite eccentric bunch of impressive individuals. The do-gooders. In 1848, a popular new hymn for children, All Things Bright and Beautiful, portrayed a life that was almost feudal. He made the, the rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate. God made them high and lowly and ordered their estate. This was a divinely ordained universe in which everyone knew their place. The rich man in the castle at Wimborne St Giles in Dorset was Anthony Ashley Cooper, later to become the 7th Earl of Shaftesbury. At the age of 25, Shaftesbury had become a Tory MP. With a strong sense of hierarchy and duty, he was deeply conservative. The family motto was love, serve. In fact, Shaftesbury had known little love in his early years. Beaten and neglected by his cruel father, he was closest to the housekeeper, who drew him towards evangelical Christianity. God was the great driving force in Shaftesbury's life. He believed we are all children of God, and therefore everybody deserves to live a dignified life. He also believed, literally, in the imminent second coming of Christ. All his envelopes had stamped on them an inscription from the book of Revelation in Greek. Elhu hurie Jesu, so come Lord Jesus. If you think the end of the world is nigh, then there's no time to hang about when it comes to saving souls or reforming the nation. Shaftesbury was a man looking for a mission. And when, in 1832, he read a series of articles in the Times about child labour, he found it. The Industrial Revolution was changing Britain as never before, and it seemed the inevitable price of progress, that children worked oppressive, long hours for meagre wages in unregulated workplaces. And few people cared. They didn't see children because people didn't have childhoods historically. They just saw little people who could potentially make themselves or preferably uh, the mill owner a bit of money. And, and their then parents, presumably. And their parents, and then drop dead. They'd work like slaves. They are very useful in particular kinds of employment. I mean, typically down mines working very, very small 
uh, seams where adults can't go, and also in factories, um, scooting underneath the machinery to pick out the detritus, sort of cotton balls and so forth, that get swept under there. So children are valuable as economic units. Of course, children working was nothing new. Even the rural Shaftesbury estate would have had farm boys and scullery maids. But Shaftesbury was alarmed at how the old ties that bound society together were disintegrating. The French Revolution had made it terrifyingly clear that the aristocracy ignored the poor at their peril. So he wasn't entirely disinterested when he determined to do something about child labour. These days, if I wanted to employ a seven-year-old, I could only do so if they were an actor, model or a dancer, and then I'd have to get a special licence for them. I'd have to prove that no adult could do the work, and I'd have to get them a medical certificate, and I'd have to get their head teacher to guarantee that their schoolwork wouldn't suffer, and I'd have to provide a chaperone to ensure their health, comfort and kind treatment. And for every four hours I got them to work, I'd have to give them an hour off. Things really have changed. In the 19th century, no one, not even the humanitarian Lord Shaftesbury, was arguing that children shouldn't go out to work at all. He wanted to reform the harsh conditions of industrial labour. One of his then radical ideas was that children in factories, for example, should have their hours limited to a mere 10 a day. This went against the laissez-faire wisdom of the day that employers should be free to make full use of children's economic potential. But in 1840, Shaftesbury persuaded the House of Commons to set up a Royal Commission of Inquiry into children's employment. The commissioners set about collecting evidence, visiting and interviewing children where they worked. Shaftesbury, too, toured factory districts and even went down a mine shaft, writing in his diary, thought it a duty, easier to talk after you've seen. <laughs> Children these days get sent down mines only on school trips. <laughs> Ian Morris at the Blenathan coal mine, Big Pit, is a former miner and will be my tour guide 300 feet underground. OK, you comfortable? Yep. Yep, lights on you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Tell me what children were doing down a mine. Well, children at that time would be pushing the drums around, working 12 hours a day. In some mines, they work 14 hours a day. Yeah. What, for a six-year-old or a seven-year-old? In some mines, you're looking at four and five years old. The only way we can direct the air around our mine is by using these ventilation doors. So a little trapper boy, OK? He'd have a little rope around his wrist and around the door handle. And his job would be to open and close the door when the drums and horses came through in the darkness. So the other children who were working were pushing and pulling heavy carts? Yes. Their job, OK, would be to have a girdle, a band around their waist, OK, a belt, a chain hanging through their legs, and they'd be down on all fours and they'd be climbing through. Some drams had wheels, but the sledges was just a wooden rail underneath and they would be dragging the sledge across. Okay? Right. So it was very, very hard work. Really hard yeah, work? very hard work. We had rats in the mine as well. Rats would be climbing all over them. So we've got experience now where the little boys and girls, our trapper boys, had to work in, OK? So we turn our lights off for a few seconds, OK? Switch is on the right-hand side. Turn it either way, OK? OK, right. I'm stand, off. stand still, don't move. Can you imagine being five, six-year-old, working 12 hours a day and all those rats running around your feet? I've had enough after 10 seconds, let alone 12 hours. Terrifying. The first report of Shaftesbury's inquiry into child labour was published in 1842 and dealt exclusively with the mines. It was innovative in using illustrations to show the working conditions of children and its revelations appalled the nation.
Reading these accounts and looking at these pictures is still terribly shocking. These are very small children in awful, cramped conditions with huge loads, basically working like slaves. And because of the black and the coal, they actually look like slaves in the pictures. And the Victorian audience was shocked. Admittedly, some of them were more shocked by the fact that the boys and girls weren't wearing any clothes than by the working conditions. But the whole report gave Shaftesbury sufficient ammunition to try and persuade the House of Commons to stop children working down the mines at all. This radical suggestion provoked furious opposition. The MP for Bolton, who was a mine owner, argued that it would unjustly deprive children of their honest livelihood and would drive them and their families into the workhouse. Others suggested that working from a young age was good and developed useful, industrious habits and was much better than letting children wander around in idleness. Yet others said that the entire mining industry would collapse if it wasn't allowed to use child labour. These are exactly the same arguments still used by owners of sweatshops all over the world whenever they want to employ children. <laughs> But Shaftesbury won his case. The 1842 Mines Act made it illegal for children to work down the mines, if they were under 10. And this was just the beginning. Shaftesbury campaigned for flower girls and shoeshine boys, for children in factories, brickyards and even circuses. His name became indelibly associated with the cause of exploited children. The current Earl of Shaftesbury is Nicholas uh, Ashley Nick, Cooper. He's 30 Thank years you. old and a former DJ. Is this the family album, then? Well, this is one of the family <laughs> albums. It has lots of Victorian-esque um, photos, um, but some really interesting ones of the, um, of the seventh Earl at, at St Giles' house. Um, and actually, here's, here's a nice one with an interesting arrangement. Um, and you can see here in the corner is the seventh Earl standing. Very recognisable. Look yeah, on mutton face. chops. Yeah. Looking incredibly stern. Yes, um, we often see him as, uh, as, as someone with sort of deep lines and sort of furrowed brow. And it's clearly someone who is sort of wearing the sign of the times, or at least the times that he's dealing with on his face. You know, it's amazing how many issues he took on mm. and how much he did in his perseverance. One of the, the things I admire most about what he did was he really went against the grain mm. you know at the time a lot of people sort of shunned the idea of coming down and speaking to like a lower class I mean god forbid you know obviously times have changed dramatically since then what do you think when you pass Piccadilly Circus and see Eros and all the backpackers of Europe assembled there do you think that's yeah. my ancestor <laughs> there and well I do I think it's I think it's a sort of you know it's a huge great um, source of pride and, and whenever I see it and I often wonder how uh, sort of disassociated people are who are all around it with actually what it was and what it sort of symbolises. Victorian do-gooders are much mocked nowadays as interfering busybodies but when you consider the career of someone like Shaftesbury perhaps they deserve a little more respect. He spent 50 years in Parliament, doggedly campaigning for good causes, and justifiably earned himself the nickname the Prince of Philanthropists. His youthful portrait hangs as inspiration in Committee Room 12. But Shaftesbury himself was often cast down by the indifference of others. Every day, he wrote, blackens with fresh horrors and the revival of old ones. Perhaps do-gooders always feel that it's an uphill struggle. But Shaftesbury did more for children than any statesman of his or perhaps any other age. Through his legislation, we started to define childhood as a period that needed protection from the law. And for the first time, the state began to recognise that children were more than just miniature units of economic production. Limiting the hours children worked gave them more time to get an education. Formal schooling was still mostly the preserve of the privileged, 
but a growing number of do-gooders were doing their bit to educate the poor by opening what were known as ragged schools. Run by volunteers, they took children off the streets, taught them the Bible, and if they were lucky, to read and write. In 1846, a new ragged school was opened in Bristol by an almost quintessentially do-gooding spinster. Mary Carpenter was the middle-class, middle-aged daughter of a non-conformist minister. She burned with a compulsion to set the world to rights. Mary Carpenter was deeply influenced by her father and by the Unitarian circles in, in Bristol in which, which she, she was brought up. Uh, she was also very aware that she was not terribly attractive and she was looking for a role in life. She saw lots of children in the slums in Bristol where she worked who were really hungry and ill-clothed. And that, I think, gave her a sense of what she should do with her life. Carpenter's school was in an area of Bristol that was notorious as a thieves' kitchen. Most of her pupils belonged to the local gangs, and when they weren't in school, they were running riot. The world of Oliver Twist, first created by Charles Dickens in 1837, has become one of the most enduring stereotypes of Victorian England. Back then, it reflected a shocking reality. He'll do. The streets really did teem with gangs of vagrant children, artful dodgers who were so poor they turned to crime simply to survive. Stop thief! These were the children Mary Carpenter wanted to help, but the public consensus was that they were simply feral criminals who should be locked up and the key thrown away. An attitude that sounds familiar. The biggest problem is these youngsters haven't got nowhere to go. So there's this our street, it's causing problems. Children, in this yobo you're talking about. Yobo. In this street. Too many. And what would you do with them? What would I would we do with them? Huh. I hung them. Do the crime, you do the time. Right, no matter what age you are. No matter what yeah. age, from a child to very old. You do the crime, you do the time. These days, despite public opinion, the law does distinguish between adults and children. But in Mary Carpenter's time, it didn't, and more than half of her pupils had been behind bars. Mary Carpenter's school journal records the shocking effect of prison on her pupils. She wrote of one previously kindly boy. When released, within a week he was in prison again for a similar offence. No one recognised the same boy. He was thoroughly reckless and talked carelessly with other boys of his prison adventures. Banging up young children seemed to Mary Carpenter a sure way to raise hardened criminals. She had the then radical idea that perhaps it wasn't that her pupils were innately evil, but that they were poor and neglected, and perhaps they should be treated fundamentally differently from adults. Convinced that young offenders should be reformed rather than punished, Carpenter set about touring prisons, writing books, even giving evidence to Parliament becoming the leading expert in juvenile delinquency in the country. It was extraordinary for a woman of her time, but she didn't stop there. In 1854, she opened the very first reformatory school for girls in Britain. Red Lodge was donated to Carpenter by wealthy do-gooder Lady Byron, widow of the famous poet a man not noted for encouraging moral behaviour in young girls. The Elizabethan house must have felt an incongruous setting for the first batch of unruly adolescents who arrived, fresh from the streets or prison. 
This book was written by Mary Carpenter to explain the ethos of the reformatory, and in it is a list of principles, rules, and regulations. There is some genuinely groundbreaking material. It says every girl on entering the school is to begin with a new character, and the best teachers will secure obedience and good conduct with the least punishment. They must avoid any expressions or mode of treatment calculated to awaken resentful feelings in the girls. They must not make them feel members of a degraded class. And this is pretty enlightened, given the alternative was having a whipping in prison. And Mary Carpenter is very perceptive. She says, the girls admitted to this school will be accustomed to the uncontrolled exercise of their will, a violent passion, extremely sensitive to imagined injury. But, and this is clearly what kept her going, she says they will be equally sensible to kindness. Like many Victorian reformers, Carpenter believed it best for children to grow up in a family environment. She thought the Red Lodge girls needed to be loved, and she hugged and kissed them and gave them toys from her own childhood. It's all very well believing that love will conquer all, but anyone who's ever met even a mildly delinquent teenager will guess that it wasn't entirely plain sailing. There was problem after problem. There was Agnes, who set fire to the house. There was Rose, a kleptomaniac, who buried the keys to the school in the garden. There was sweet Eliza, who encouraged the younger girls to take up prostitution in the most graphic possible terms. No wonder there was a rapid turnover of staff. Caught between Carpenter's utopian demands and trying to keep the unruly girls in check, in October 1857, the staff insisted on building punishment cells in the basement. Carpenter optimistically wrote in her diary, I believe that their existence will check the necessity of their use. Wishful thinking. The very next month, three girls stole petticoats and bonnets from other girls and the teachers, dressed up in them and made their escape. When the police caught them and brought them back, they were put in the new cells, where they shouted and screamed incessantly. Mary Carpenter sat with them, trying to reason with them for a whole day. But when one of them was let out to go to the bathroom, it took four people to get her back inside the cell because she became so violent. Mary Carpenter admitted defeat, called the police, and the girls were sentenced to three months in prison. Carpenter was overwhelmed with distress, collapsed, and was ill for a week. You can try and try to help people, but sometimes they just don't want to be helped. Despite the catalogue of problems, the majority of Red Lodge girls did well. With kindness and education, most grew up to find steady employment and live respectable lives. Influenced by Carpenter's work, the law was changed to recognise reformatory schools as an alternative to prison for young offenders. By 1858, over 2,000 children were housed in 45 such schools around the country. Carpenter's work was in its way revolutionary and her ideas far ahead of her time. They live on in the widespread recognition that young offenders deserve to be treated separately and differently from adults with special care and attention from the law. Mary Carpenter reminds us that we have a duty to tackle the causes of crime, her phrase, as well as crime itself. But one of Carpenter's modern successors thinks we're still too ready to label children as criminal. We um, have a very paradoxical attitude to children who commit crime and children and the competencies of children. So we say children cannot be on a jury in a court until they're 18 because they're not cognitively developed enough to make appropriate decisions about criminality. And yet, our age of criminal responsibility is 10. So what are we saying? You're not competent enough to work out whether somebody else has committed a crime, but, oh, you are incredibly competent, age 10, 
to work out that you've just committed a crime. Do you know what? If Mary Carpenter was here, she would be laughing the house down at our lack of intelligence and lack of insight in relation to these issues. As reformers like Carpenter and Shaftesbury started to suggest that children should be treated differently from adults, people increasingly thought about childhood as a special period of life, to be relished and cherished. In the middle of the 19th century, literature, written especially for children, began to flourish. But most children, of course, didn't have the time or education to read stories. And for one author, the plight of these children without childhood became a cause célèbre. The Reverend Charles Kingsley was a passionate preacher who loved nature so much he once broke off mid-sermon to step down and rescue an injured butterfly. As a literary do-gooder, he'd made his name writing campaigning novels for adults. Kingsley was a Christian socialist who had a, a passionate commitment to changing the whole of society. He wasn't an evangelical. Um, he enjoyed life. He wasn't goody-goody. He had all kinds of bizarre sexual fantasies. Uh, he liked his wife to dress up as a nun and he dressed up as a monk. Um, <laughs> But in terms of improving the human lot, Charles Kingsley did a vast amount. In 1862, Kingsley wrote the book he's most famous for, The Water Babies. The fantasy adventure story for children immediately became an influential bestseller. Its hero is a chimney sweep called Tom. Inspiration may have come from the many chimneys at Kingsley's Rectory in Eversley, Hampshire, where I met Master Sweep Martin Glynn. OK, Martin, this is Charles Kingsley's fireplace. Yeah. This would have had a boy up it, would it? Without a doubt. It's very narrow up there. What, what, what size are we talking to get a, a, a child up? In some chimneys, in some cases, the dimensions were as small as 9 inches by 14 inches, even smaller. Right, that's, that's, that's a small boy, isn't it? That is, and we can see stepping stones inside there where a boy would have climbed. It's, it's literally above the throat of the chimney there. It's pretty amazing that the little boy is scampering up these chimneys. In some cases, they were nine years old and ten years old. God, it gets narrower and narrower when you go up. Yeah. Just see a crack of um, blue from here. The children were soaked in brine, salt water, to toughen their skin up. Pretty tough times. And, uh, and also, the soot inside some chimneys is almost like quicksilver. It can quickly fill the lungs and the nose, and uh, it doesn't take long, a few seconds, a, f a couple of minutes, and somebody could be suffocated to death. And, of course, there was another big hazard. There wasn't another the, one. Another yeah. big hazard uh, from the soot itself. In those days, uh, uh, the chimney sweep boys, when they got a little bit older, they used to get the sweep's cancer, which was cancer of the testicles. Right. Um, so okay. not a very nice job at all. In The Water Babies, Tom falls down a chimney into a little girl's bedroom and realises for the first time how dirty he is. He runs away from his cruel master, Grimes, desperate to get clean, and falls into a river. Most of the rest of his adventures, in which Tom has to learn to be good, take place underwater. Good, clean water had great significance for Kingsley. He campaigned for improved sanitation and against the pollution of rivers. But water also had a deeper spiritual meaning for him. Cleanliness, after all, was next to godliness, and Tom's drowning is a sort of baptism. Born again, 
he can develop into the man he would have been if he'd had a proper childhood. Victorian children were often given drearily didactic moral fables to read. The infant's progress from the valley of destruction to everlasting glory was an unlikely bestseller for nearly the first half of the 19th century. In these books, children are seen as naturally wicked, stained with that old original sin from the moment of conception and in need of firm moral guidance and rigid discipline in order to become good. The world of Kingsley's Water Babies could not be more different. It's fun and funny and weird and entertaining, and in it, the children are given an innate innocence and an imagination which makes them special. Echoing the words of Mary Carpenter about the girls in Red Lodge, Kingsley is rejecting that strict old orthodoxy of original sin in favour of a gentler, newer belief in the innocence of children. As he put it, they come fresh out of heaven. Kingsley's vision for a perfect childhood included a decent education, and he founded a school in his village. Education had become a hot topic of debate amongst the chattering classes, and in The Water Babies, Kingsley offers up a damning critique of the way Victorian schooling was going. He parodies interference by government bureaucrats. How long will it take a school inspector of average activity to tumble head over heels from London to York? The emphasis on rote learning. And one cried, can you show me how to extract this square root? And an obsession with results. And what God on earth will it do if I did tell you, quoth Tom? Well, they didn't know that. All they knew was the examiner was coming. OK, who can tell me what they think the point of the book is? What's the point of Tom's story? Well, I think that was kind of reflecting the Victorian education because Victorians thought that children should learn this and learn that and not have a say in anything. And I'm so glad it's changed because <laughs> um, we, we have a balance it. We are taught all the basic things and also so much more, like how to be a better person and all our habits of mind, which are resourcefulness, motivation, organisation, humour and perseverance. That sounds like a list. Um, and you've learnt it. Yeah. <laughs> That's very, very good. I think it's about learning a lesson and being yourself but being responsible and taking responsibility for your actions. Tom is a bit mean, but in the end he gets nicer, so I think the story's about people can change. In my eyes, Kingsley wrote, the question is not what to teach, but how to educate. No wonder he's not on the national curriculum now. But he really did change Victorian attitudes to children. It's absolutely extraordinary fact that the Water Babies was published and almost instantly the law was changed uh, and it became impossible to shove little boys up chimneys for the purpose of chimney sweeping. Almost instantaneously. Charles Kingsley was buried in his own churchyard at Eversley in 1875. Five years later, compulsory education for all children was finally introduced. This cemented the new idea of childhood as separate and special. Kingsley had adored the romantic poetry of Wordsworth, who had portrayed children as pure, close to nature and therefore nearer to God. But some Victorians would become besotted with this idea. The Victorians idealised childhood and surround it, I have to say, with a couple of layers of really sugary schmaltz. I mean, if you read some children's literature, it is really, really hard to stomach. You know, really, really good children lead really, really good lives and then die in really, really affecting ways. 
pausing only to pass on their blessings to their younger siblings. So Victorians become very, very sentimental about childhood. They take that innocent ideal and they make it something slightly stomach-turning. <laughs> Do-gooders quickly cottoned on to how the new idealisation of childhood could be exploited to beneficial ends. No one did this better than Thomas Bernardo. Bernardo is perhaps the most famous of all the Victorian do-gooders, and that's partly because he did his best to ensure that he became a legend in his own lifetime. By the 1870s, do-gooding was happening on a much larger, and more organised scale, and Bernardo was its arch practitioner. He had a genius for propaganda and publicity, and he told great stories. One of his favourites was the tale of Jim Jarvis, a homeless, ragged schoolboy who took Bernardo out onto the streets of the East End at midnight to show him how many children were sleeping rough. It was at that moment, he wrote afterwards, it seemed as though the hand of God himself had pulled aside the curtain which concealed from my view the untold misery of forlorn child life upon the streets of London. It was a revelation that was to change Bernardo's life. Bernardo had arrived in London from Dublin in 1866, planning to go on to China as a medical missionary. He was arrogant and assertive, but then he firmly believed his life was a channel for God's work. Shocked by the poverty he found in the capital, where some 30,000 youngsters regularly slept out on the streets, Bernardo abandoned his plans to go abroad and set up a mission for destitute children here at home. It's a good moment for him because the image of the street child is becoming sentimentalised. Soon after he sets up, the Anglicans set up uh, the Waifs and Strays Society, which in its very name uh, suggests something we should, we should, people we should feel sorry for rather than threatened by, as street children often have been seen as threatening in the middle of the century. And Bernardo is able to play on that, on that sympathy that is there in the public and you can raise money for it. Bernardo had soon raised enough money to open his first home for boys, clothing, feeding and teaching them simple trades. And when he was given the generous wedding present of a house in Barkingside in Essex, he used the land to build his village home for girls. No destitute child ever refused admission. That was Bernardo's famous slogan. An admission to a place like this, spacious cottages, each with its own garden, must have seemed unimaginable luxury to children whose previous experience was the crowded slums of the East End. These ledgers record all the admissions of the children admitted to Bernardo's, and this is boys from 1872. This is William Martin Bellis. Uh, he's seen loitering about Borough Market by a gentleman who directs him to the home. He arrives in a most miserable plight. He is literally covered with vermin from head to foot. And you can see in the pictures these extraordinary before and after. They come in tattered, ragged, dirty, and they're cleaned up, spruced up, and capable of taking a job. And that's the Bernardos do. They find them a position. This report says of uh, William that he's a very steady boy. And this is the pattern of um, these reports. This is Alfred Manship. He's arrested for vagrancy, became a wanderer, slept at night in the fields, and uh, finally the kind lady interested herself in him and sent him to Dr Bernardo. And one of the interesting things about a lot of these stories is how often um, a do-gooder has intervened. It says he was found by a lady. A gentleman pointed him towards Bernardo's. It seems that there were more and more do-gooders out there noticing these children and trying to help. 
The art of photography was still young, and Bernardo was a pioneer in how he used it to promote his cause. These photos were sold to raise money, rather like charity Christmas cards today. But Bernardo, with his eye for good publicity, wasn't always absolutely scrupulous with the truth. Some of the before and after photos were taken on the same day in a studio, and he wasn't averse to ripping the clothes to make them more ragged or adding a few props to make the photos more heart-rending. When allegations of photo fakery came out, Bernardo was embroiled in scandal. The mother of these girls complained that her daughters had arrived at Bernardo's in respectable clothes and was outraged at photos showing them in rags, selling newspapers in the streets, which they'd never done. Bernardo felt that artistic licence, small falsities in individual cases, did not stop the pictures being genuinely representative of the plight of thousands of children in Britain. He felt that the ends justified the means. Bernardo's economies with the truth, his exuberant personality and his stellar success rubbed a lot of people up the wrong way. But what worried his critics most of all was that he seemed to be attacking that most sacred of Victorian institutions, the family. Bernardo wrote pamphlets with melodramatic titles, like Worse Than Orphans, How I Stole Two Girls and Fought for a Boy. He wrote that bad parents were the worst enemies to the well-being of their unfortunate offspring. And he had no hesitation in rescuing children from parents who he thought were not fit to care for them. He called this philanthropic abduction. This was innovative but dangerous territory. The law then did not allow children to be removed from their parents, even if there was evidence of abuse. Protecting children in public places was one thing. Interfering in private family life, quite another. Even the ancient Lord Shaftesbury said he could not support a law to protect children from parental cruelty because such evils are of so private and domestic a character as to be beyond the reach of legislation. Bernardo justified philanthropic abduction in the name of the child. If he found a child wandering in the streets, he felt he had a right to take that child under his protection and, in a sense, thinks himself above the law and is prepared to say so which is a, a brave thing to do, if sometimes a foolish thing to do. He also plays the role of father to all these children. He is more or less saying to them, forget your natural parents and think of me as your father and you can rely on me. And I think many of the Bernardo children did come to think of him as a father. Philanthropic abduction was hugely controversial. It repeatedly landed Bernardo in hot water, and several times even in court. But he was vindicated when the law was changed. In an Act of Parliament of 1889, known popularly as the Children's Charter, the state was enabled, for the first time, to intervene between parent and child. This was groundbreaking. No longer mere chattels of their parents, children now had rights of their own. And the most important thing of all, was their welfare. Balancing the wish to keep families together with the welfare of children remains a contentious issue. Bernardo's today is run by Martin Neri. We need to take more, not fewer, children in care in the UK. Right, that's a very controversial position, isn't it? Well, it, it's, it's less controversial than it was. I was vilified for saying it, but actually, uh, one of the things I've concluded, having come from the Bernard's five years ago from the prison service and believing that care damaged all children and we should avoid it at all costs, what I've realised is that actually being abused at home is what damages children and care can't put it right. Although care does, contrary to popular belief, care does make things a bit better. 
This is where you're following entirely in Bernardo's footsteps. I mean, he really annoyed the Victorian establishment that had this huge value on family, and you didn't interfere in family. And, and he say, and you're saying, yes, you should. A huge amount of the work we do is about fixing families, and we can and should do that, and we succeed. But there comes a time when we have to think of what's best for the child. And there's a myth out there that we have to balance the rights of the parents and the child. Nonsense. If there's a thread between Thomas Bernardo and us now, it's that we absolutely put the welfare of the child first. And regrettably, if that means breaking up a family, we should do that. When Dr Bernardo died in 1905, mourners lined the streets to pay their respects as the cortege made its way to Barkingside. There were now nearly 100 Bernardo homes in Britain, and in his lifetime, some 60,000 children had passed through his care. Bernardo's obituary described him as a moral genius of the supremely great order. That was written by William Thomas Stead, a do-gooder whose mission to rescue children had taken him into dark moral territory, using techniques even more controversial than Bernardo's. W.T. Stead was a journalist. There aren't many memorials to journalists, surprisingly, but he was a radical, a maverick and an innovator. He'd given up conventional Christianity and taken up spiritualism. He was also pretty obsessive. He once cooked and ate mice on toast in order to imagine what it was like starving at the siege of Paris. He liked to describe himself as a barbarian from the north having come down from Northumberland to work on the Pall Mall Gazette, an influential and soon-to-be-notorious evening newspaper. In a new era of journalism, Stead was an innovator. To transform his newspaper, he introduced bold headlines, interviews and illustrations. He also launched a series of campaigning crusades on liberal issues. Votes for women, compulsory schooling, you name it, he wanted it. Stead manages to do an awful lot of public good, there's no doubt about that, but he also manages to boost his own career in the process. So it's a very sort of muddy set of uh, motivations that keep him going. Um, he's a man of extraordinary energy with a very, very good eye for publicity, like Bernardo, very, very good eye for what will make a good campaign. <laughs> Stead's biggest splash came in 1885, when he decided to highlight the plight of some of the most exploited children in Britain. With the Victorian idealisation of children came a perverted desire to corrupt them, and there was an unprecedented demand for child prostitutes. Fear of sexually transmitted diseases drove some men to seek out younger girls on the grounds that they would be cleaner and an appalling superstition grew up that having sex with a virgin would cure you of venereal disease, a belief still held in certain parts of the world in respect to AIDS. Juvenile prostitution was rampant in London. Girls as young as nine worked the streets, and there was also a trade in young English girls being bought and sold as merchandise to continental brothels. Worst of all, perhaps, having sex with young girls seemed to be indirectly sanctioned by the state. Though there was an age of consent, it was only 13. Stead decided that this was a cause that could benefit from the shock tactics of a popular newspaper. In the summer of 1885, he began an undercover investigation setting out to persuade the establishment to raise the age of consent. Opposition to a higher age was strong. As one member of the House of Lords put it, very few of their lordships had not, when young men, been guilty of immorality. 
he hoped that they would pause before passing a clause within the range of which might come their sons. Touring London's seediest spots, Stead met with pimps, prostitutes and policemen to find out all he could about the child sex trade. But he didn't stop at interviewing sources. Stead wanted a sensational stunt. So, without pausing to worry about what we would call journalistic ethics, he posed as a champagne-swilling, cigar-smoking, upper-class client in order to see how easy it would be to buy a virgin child for sex. Using a former prostitute as an intermediary, Stead found his victim, a 13-year-old girl called Eliza Armstrong. The deal was done with her mother, and the girl was bought for five pounds. Poor Eliza had very little idea what was going on. After a traumatic and intrusive inspection by a backstreet abortionist who confirmed she was a virgin, she was brought by cab here to Poland Street. She was taken into a brothel above a ham and beef shop lightly drugged with chloroform, thoughtfully provided by the abortionist, and then undressed. Stead entered the room, Eliza screamed, but luckily for her, he already had what he wanted, the story. Then, like generations of journalists after him, he made his excuses and left. Stead knew he had an explosive story. On the 4th of July, the Pall Mall Gazette issued a warning to its readers, the kind of warning that would, perhaps, most whet their appetites. All those who are squeamish, and all those who are prudish, and all those who prefer to live in a fool's paradise of imaginary innocence and purity, selfishly oblivious to the horrible realities which torment those whose lives are passed in the London inferno, will do well not to read the Pall Mall Gazette of Monday and the three following days. This is Stead's report, which he called the Maiden Tribute of Modern Babylon, a very upmarket title evoking the decadent biblical city and the classic myth of the seven virgins delivered over to the Minotaur. Um, the report itself is actually rather downmarket, sensationalist and what we would call tabloid. Stead rather gives himself away in the opening sentence. He says the report of our secret commission will be read today with a shuddering horror that will thrill throughout the world. And it's the use of the words horror and thrill in the same sentence that tells you what's coming. Stead goes to town and so do the sub-editors. The violation of virgins, the confessions of a brothel keeper, the London slave market, how girls are bought and ruined, a dreadful profession. And then the long account, which is Stead's own story, a child of 13 bought for five pounds. He writes, the complete innocence of the girl extorted pity even from the hardened heart of the old abortionist. The poor little thing, she exclaimed, she is so small, her pain will be extreme. I hope you will not be too cruel with her. It is the mix of moral outrage and titillating detail that we find worrying. But it is crusading investigative journalism exposing a real vice. This is child rape he's talking about. And he's very forceful in what he says needs to be done, which is the raising of the age of consent. He concludes with a, a, a very typical Victorian metaphor. Fish out of season are not fit to be eaten. Girls who have not reached the age of puberty are not fit even to be seduced. The law ought at least to be as strict about a live child as a dead salmon. Difficult to argue with that. The Maiden Tribute was a publishing sensation. Stead's vivid writing sparked an almost hysterical outburst of public feeling and support. Within a matter of weeks, the law of the land was changed. Thanks to Stead, 
the age of consent was raised to 16 in an act of parliament popularly known at the time as Stead's Act. But this was not the end of the story for our do-gooder, who soon found himself on trial at the Old Bailey, charged with abduction. Stead was prosecuted for the very offence he'd been campaigning against. And in the spotlight of the trial, his journalistic methods came under close scrutiny. It was revealed that the sale of Eliza was a bit of a put-up job. The procurer had told Eliza's mother that the girl was destined for a life of domestic service, not child prostitution. So what Stead had presented as a heroic rescue could also be described as entrapment. Stead was found guilty, but only because he'd purchased Eliza with her mother's and not her father's permission. He was sentenced to three months in prison. There's no doubt that Stead stepped way over the line, and it's easy to dismiss his particular brand of attention-seeking journalism with its appetite for the sensational and its sometimes fluid relationship with the truth as highly distasteful. But as Stead's heirs on today's tabloids rarely fail to point out, you can't argue with the results. And when it comes to raising the age of consent to 16, which it still is, still protecting children from predatory adults, then, like it or not, it was the Pall Mall Gazette what won it. For the rest of his life, Stead continued to agitate on causes close to his heart. And perhaps with an eye for a good story right to the very end, he was last seen leading women and children to safety on the Titanic. During Queen Victoria's reign, over a hundred Acts of Parliament for the benefit of children were passed into law. Every child was now entitled to an education, safer working conditions and freedom from abuse. Childhood had been redefined forever. As the new century dawned, the child who now captured the public imagination was J.M. Barry's Peter Pan, the boy who wanted never to grow up. For Charles Dickens' child heroes like Oliver Twist, childhood was a misery to be endured. For Peter Pan, childhood was magical. Perhaps that's going too far. Certainly Lord Shaftesbury or Mary Carpenter would not have approved of a modern Neverland of delayed responsibility and infantilised adulthood. But the achievements of our do-gooders remain extraordinary. Through their persistent and conscientious efforts, childhood could now be thought of, to misquote Dickens, not as the worst of times, but as the best of times. Next week, the do-gooders face their biggest challenge yet. The British love of illicit sex and excessive alcohol. Can the nation learn the error of its ways? Or have the do-gooders finally met their match? <laughs> <laughs>